Hello everyone, today we are taking a look at the Darwin FPV Sin Ape 3.5. Uh, this one comes in a couple of different editions and analog, which is what we have here, 4 and 6S with uh, some different receiver options. And one of the questions I have right off the bat is we've seen this prop protected style a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. I know, some of you have been saying, you know, thank goodness not another Sin Whoop review. I, I feel you, we just, we've seen these so many times. And for those of you that look for these, what is the draw? I've asked this before, and I really didn't get much of a response, so if you could, if you like this sort of style, tell me why, and that might help us understand why companies keep iterating time and time again with this prop protected style across all the different prop sizes. But if you're not familiar with Darwin FPV, they've kind of made their name in the budget line of quadcopters, drones if you will. And so they don't necessarily run the newest component technology in theirs, and that's how they save a little bit of money. But one thing I don't think they skimped on was the GPS, because the first time I plugged it in, I had seven satellites within a minute or two, which is kind of what we're seeing on the newer tech of GPS. Maybe GPS is just seriously cheap. But let's go ahead, check it out, and we'll talk about it further. The motors are 2006, 3400 kV. If you get the 6S version, same size of motor, but 20. 30 kV. And the props on those motors are the Gemfan D90S tri-ablated props. As I mentioned, I have the analog edition, which means the Cadex Ant is the FPV camera. The GPS is the Darwin FPV GM8 GPS. The only one flight controller, uh, which has a USB-C port right up here and does come with one of those little plugs for it, is the Darwin FPV F411. It is 3 to 6S compatible and it has a 45 amp ESC on there. VTX, as you can see down there, it has the uh, MCX connector down there. Is the Darwin FPV VT5804, which is one we've seen around, uh, goes clear up to one watt. There's an XT60 for a battery connection. The Express LRS edition is SPI. So in order to upgrade to a newer version, if say version four of Express LRS were to come out, you have to upgrade Betaflight. That's what an SPI Express LRS receiver means. It's built into the board, and therefore the version of Express LRS is baked into the version of Beta FPV. So that's one holdback. We got 3D printed mounts for our GPS and our external HD camera, as well as all our different antenna mounting options. Two foam pads on the bottom for landing. Battery mat is kind of two separate pieces. It is texturized and it is rubber. The top plate is all one piece. It looks to be three and a half millimeters thick. And motor post to motor post, I'm getting about 151 millimeters. A little bit hard to see there with the shadows, but uh, without a battery or external HD camera, it weighs 277 grams. I flew it mainly on this Beta FPV Lava 850 battery. Of course, for something like this, you could fly a much larger battery, say a 1300, which I did test one of my super old batteries that are 1300s, uh, but up to 1500, which I don't have. And with that 850, it comes to 372 grams. I did also fly it with my naked GoPro. This is the, the new V2 edition from Flywoo that I recently reviewed on the channel. And to use that, I needed the mount and the screws. I also needed to power it. And last but not least, I needed the screw for the mount. And that brought the flying weight up to 433 and a half grams. The largest battery I tested is this Infinity 1300 for S battery, but this thing has got to be five, six years old, and I've used it as a goggle battery. So the flight time I got on this was just a touch over nine minutes. But you know, with a fresh current line of battery, I would expect you to get more flight time than this. But for weight purposes, this might be of use. And with that 1300 milliamp 4S Infinity battery, it comes in just under 500 grams. It comes with this foam padding, which you could put around the outside of your prop protection for a touch more safety or protection from damaging things. Came with five extra zip ties, four more landing feet, four antenna tubes, and four caps for those antenna tubes, and a smattering of screws and nuts for repairs or just re-securing things down. It does come with a short manual, which does talk about the precautions and setup processes and a little bit of beta flight and uh, some information that you might need about the all-in-one as well. And last but not least, it comes with two sheets of stickers. We're going to start off with the 850 milliamp forest battery, that uh, lava beta FPV battery in a faster sort of flight. I know this is not the design intent. These are designed around being safe and slow and flat, sort of get your shot sort of flying. But I like to test them in more aggressive style because, quite honestly... The Sin Whoops have gotten so much better than they used to be. Now, I want to say right off the bat that if you're comparing the same prop size, same uh, battery cell count to the same sort of quad that does not have prop protection, the quad without prop protection is going to outperform the quad with prop protection every time. 
I just want to make that super clear. Th that's not, you know, a bias or anything. That's just how it is. The prop protection, you know, it has wind resistance. It's not very aerodynamic. And even though they fly pretty well, you're going to get more flight time without the prop protection. And you're going to get uh, better prop handling. You're going to get more aggressive flight. Uh, it's going to be more capable of various maneuvers. You're going to get more overall thrust and punch on short punches, long punches, just because of the aerodynamics. Uh, but they are capable. As you can see, you know, I can do what I can do within my space just fine. Uh, of course, if you want the longest possible flight time, uh, I would look at 6S. They offer that feature. They also offer uh, Walk Snail and other video. I think it was other video systems. They had a couple different. I think, let me go back and look here just a second. Yes, they have the uh, Wasp. They have the O3. And they have analog, so I don't see Walk Snail or HD Zero, so it's kind of limited to the uh, current generation DJI, older generation DJI, and analog in this particular case. Uh, they do have the options of going with uh, batteries of their own size. I can't vouch for how their batteries perform at all. Uh, there's only a few battery manufacturers, so it's hard to say. I've never tested a Darwin FUV battery. I don't know how well they do or how poorly they do. Uh, one other thing I want to draw your attention to is look how slowly the OSD updates. Uh, that makes me think that that's one of the um, older technologies that have been used in here. That it, it just you'll see it especially at the end of the flight, going from the home uh, post-flight statistics screen into the the traditional flying screen. I always flip back into that. You'll see how slowly it goes back into that. And that was just something that I notice continually when I'm flying. I should note that the fan with the green 5 and the 2S 3.5 volts and the little lock and the red REC, you wouldn't see that unless you're using the HD0 goggles. Those are all very specific to the HD0 goggles. The rest of the on-screen information, that is typical beta flight information. We have my uh, uh, throttle value position in the top left-hand corner. Of course, you have the center screen in information, which has the make and manufacturer. You have the satellites. Uh, hopefully, that's apparent. It's wavering between 10 and 8. Uh, we have the link quality for Express LRS in the top right-hand corner. Uh, we've got our average cell voltage, which is what I go by. We have our overall battery voltage on the left-hand side, the battery stats. Uh, we have our amp draw. Uh, there in the middle center lower and then we have our mode which is air mode that is a uh, acro rate mode as well you might say but air mode just keeps the prop spinning all the time so you can do zero throttle maneuvers and still have control of the quad and then we have our flight time uh, down at the very bottom right but as I said th these quads these center whoops they, they fly surprisingly good compared to where they came from. We used to fly, well, we used to call them flying pizza boxes. They were just, to get any sort of reasonable flight out of those things, what was it, about four years ago? You had to have such low winds and you had to have such a good pit tune. And even then, it was a challenge to get decent flight out of these. But nowadays, they've really overcome a lot of obstacles and beta flight probably is largely, the and the quality of our electronics has largely really helped those out. Uh, you see there, oh, as, as the land now comes up, because I've run my battery too low, I got 346 on that 850, so I would say, based upon my cell average voltages, probably need to shave 10 seconds off of that flight. So on an 850 faster accelerated flight, uh, I would say 330, 335 would be a safer overall bet. Okay, we're just gonna hit the last two minutes of my slow cruisy flight. Uh, so what I did here was I have that uh, naked GoPro from Flywoo, that's a GoPro 9. Uh, that's kind of the bigger screen, the outer screen, and then what you see in the goggles is the inner screen. I uh, just wanted to show you this kind of concisely as I could. That way you can get an idea for how smooth the footage is. Uh, hopefully this works out. I've never done it this way before, at least to my recollection. Uh, so if this does not work for you and you're seriously considering this product or other products like it, um, should this be something I stick with to try to show you the GoPro view as well as the goggle view all at one time, or should I separate them out so you can get a better look? I can understand wanting them separated, uh, but I'm trying to make the videos shorter. My videos are notoriously long, uh, and I've been told to shorten them down many times over the years. So every once in a while, I'll take something like this and try to uh, help us make it a little bit more concise. Uh, but as you can see, uh, my winds are about 12 miles an hour. Of course, we're in town. We're protected to some degree from those 12 miles an hour by the fence, by the house, uh, by the trees and the branches. Uh, of course, in the summertime, we had leaves, so it would be even more protected. But it flies nice and smooth. And so to my eye, when it comes to looking at the external HD camera footage, it looks steady to me. 
Uh, and that's one of those things when you're doing the slow, slower uh, exploratory flight that I think most people are looking at is how is the footage when you're flying, you know, you're doing some sort of scenic sort of pass to get kind of a nice shot that you like to look at. How smooth is that? So uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm flying the Naked GoPro on this particular flight. I do want to report before we get too deep, uh, I did try, as I say, the 1300 milliamp battery that I showed in the quick specs, quick specs that is very old. At the time it was a good battery, but I'm sure it's been discharged too low using it on a goggle and it's probably been left charged and discharged too low. So the, the care of that battery has not been great. But I did get about nine minutes of slow, cruisy, steady flight on that. Uh, I also tried a 650. I went smaller and got uh, four minutes and 48 seconds. So we're going to come in for our landing and you can kind of see how the screen, the OSD stuff kind of rolls through slowly. It's just, it's peculiarly slowly uh, doing that sort of refresh on screen, which I haven't seen on any other quad. But you can see our battery's in good shape and our flight time. I want to drive this point home because I think it's ex extremely important, especially for any of our friends that might be coming from a DJI Ivana or anything else that's outside of the FPV space or you're just getting started with the FPV space. When you have Express LRS, which is the receiver protocol that I love and that I recommend using because the receiver is available everywhere. You can get radios for as little as, you know, like 75 bucks and run Express LRS, or you can add a module for 50 bucks to your radio and run Express LRS. And the control link is fast. It's got extraordinary range if that's your thing. But this one is SPI. And when Express LRS first came out on All-in-Ones, SPI was the only way. But now it's no longer the only way. It's actually kind of the worst way to do things because it does mean the Express LRS version is baked into the Betaflight version that's on the flight controller. So if you, in this particular case, it came with Express 3.3. So somewhere down the line, line say, it'll be uh, coming out at some point in time with Express LRS 4, 4.1, 4.2, what have you. And so if you wanted to move to that, that means you have got to upgrade the Betaflight version that supports version 4 of Express LRS. You've also got to upgrade your radio Express LRS version to support that, but that's much easier. You can do that over Wi-Fi, but with an SPI receiver, you cannot. You have to upgrade the entire Betaflight package. And that means you take a backup, a CLI dump, we oftentimes call it, or a diff, and when you put it back on there with that newer version of Betaflight, there are going to be values invariably that don't translate from the version of Betaflight that this comes with to the version that you're moving to. So that could mean PID tuning problems. That could mean other holdbacks. So in general, this receiver itself is going to probably be a little bit of a barrier moving on to new versions of Express LRS down the road. My personal preference would be that they just include a separate Express LRS receiver altogether rather than using one on the all-in-one flight controller. So I just wanted to make that abundantly clear because to me that is the biggest drawback within this quad. I'm not a huge fan, but I do appreciate that we have some landing pads on here. I would rather see something built into the prop protection because uh, if you don't land like gracefully, if you don't kind of hover in and then just kind of, usually what we do on our hovers or our landings, we come in, we hover what we think is really close to the ground, you know, within an inch or two, and then we just kind of disarm and drop down. So if you're moving forward still, or if you have a unintended landing, a crash, and it comes in, you know, tumbling around. These are going to get torn off. Yes, we get two extra sets. But eventually, if you fly this long enough and many times, you're probably going to end up without any of these landing pads. That's why I would prefer to see them built into the prop protection. Or, you know, something else like a 3D print that bolts on to this bottom carbon fiber piece. That's what I would prefer to see. So that's one of those areas where I think, you know, this, this was easy to implement but wasn't the best possible way to implement. Um, the Cadex Ant camera, I think they could have went with just a little bit more money with a much better camera like the Cadex Baby Rattel or the Foxer Toothless 2, uh, similar sized cameras and probably only about, well, retail, only about $10 more than this one. Uh, at Last time I bought a Baby Rattel 2 was $25 and that these coming in around $15. So retail, they're about $10 difference. At least they were at one time. So I think that's an area where they save some money. So when you're shopping, you know, like for like on quads, you're probably going to find similar quads to this coming in anywhere, depending upon your, you know, the versions. If you're comparing the same versions, 
these are probably going to be 40 to $60 less than their counterparts. Maybe a lot more, depending upon what you're comparing it to. Certain companies just have higher pricing. Um, as you saw on the flight, this, this flies fine. It flies well. I didn't have any real complaints about it. But just know that the components that you're using aren't the current iteration of the, some of the other manufacturers products of course if you're not concerned about that if you are someone you know i was just chatting with a few people today online about how they're they're still flying uh three and four and five year old quads and they're perfectly happy with that there's no problem with that you don't have to keep moving to whatever the latest hotness is so if you're flying something you enjoy stick with it i talk about it all the time not upgrading your beta flight version because why it's not going to make you a better pilot. It won't necessarily make the quad fly all that much better. Depending upon your flight skills, you probably won't notice a beta flight version upgrade at all. There's really got to be some feature that you're really after in order to be a, to upgrade your firmware of beta flight or Express LRS. You don't have to upgrade your version of Express LRS. You can stay with version 3 for the rest of your life if you wanted to. So I don't want to make that an overly strong point, but... I kind of want to give it both sides of things. You can fly this stuff as long as you want to fly this stuff. Just know that it's not future proof if you want to move the firmware or the components into a you know, more current model line uh, addition. They do have adjustable camera angle. I always talk about that. Single screw. Matter of fact, I can adjust it here without even adjusting the screw and the camera holds its place pretty well. We've got a long wire in there after the camera. Let me wiggle that up and down. Uh, they've got that twisted enough to where it's not going to get down into our prop line. Uh, so that's a good thing. I would prefer, me myself, what I would probably do if I could finagle it with some tweezers or needle nose is I would probably take a zip tie and kind of loop it around here, maybe two zip ties, just to kind of make sure this stay, these wires to the GPS and to the camera stay up out of the prop line. They, they certainly shouldn't if they come wired, but you know, if you were to purchase one, check that. Check to make sure these are twisted enough that they're not going to come down into your prop. The last thing you want is to have to take a brand new quad apart in order to do some wire repairs. They may be relatively simple, but especially if you don't want to do any soldering, just check it out real quick to make sure somebody didn't have a bad day in the manufacturing plant and forget to twist. You know, they were supposed to twist 20 times, but they only twisted 16. You know, just check those little things. Uh, go around your screws. Make sure they're good and tight. You don't have to get hole candid on them, but you want to make sure things aren't going to fall apart. Uh, as far as the carbon fiber goes, let's, uh, let's do a little bendy test just to see here. I haven't been doing this recently. Whoa, that... I don't know if you can see that, but... It's firm. <laughs> Actually kind of surprised by that. So uh, that carbon fiber is stiff. And we've seen this prop protection. These materials, I presume it's the same ones we've seen around for a while. These are actually pretty dang up tough too. Uh, so I don't think there's too much of a concern unless you're flying one of these in a, a, a cement abandoned building and you're, you're going as fast as you possibly can and smack into something cement or a big iron structure or something like that. If you've got one of these, not necessarily this Darwin FPV, but this sort of prop protection that we've been seeing a while, have you broken one? Because I haven't. Of course, I fly around my house, and I don't have that many really hard structures I might be flying into. So those of you that do take these out and fly them aggressively and have knocked them against, like I say, you know, iron structures or concrete walls or something, does this lift not just on the darwin fpv side but on any of these quads we've been seeing this this to me looks like the same sort of material and design that we've seen from a company that i really like in out of the rc we've seen uh i don't think we've seen gep rc do this exact one but maybe but we've seen several different companies adopt uh this prop protection design as it's just it provides adequate protection from the prop and any sort of subject you might get too close to and bumping into them and cutting them with, with prop, but it's also far more aerodynamic than what we were using four years ago. Uh, and obviously the flight characteristics are quite good. Uh, we've got metal posts. Let's get back to the review side of things instead of talking too much. We've got metal posts, two here, one here, two on each side here, another one in back, and then another one on our tail. Uh, so that should make this all very, very solid. 
I can move it out here along this side, but um, and it's going to twist a little bit out on the edges, but it's pretty well locked down to that carbon fiber that is pretty dead gum stiff. Uh, they do use motor wire tape. Uh, I get asked about that. I'll, I'll link it down in the video description. I buy it from Amazon all the time, and that is my favorite motor wire tape. It's slick. And it doesn't have that fabric uh, side to it where the, the reason why I don't like the fabric stuff is it gathers dirt and debris. And I just don't like that. Whereas this is nice and slick. Typically, I apply this stuff with tweezers so the oils from my skin don't get on the adhesive. And they stay on real nice. Um, so I, this is one of my favorite building supplies um, outside of welder adhesive is this motor wire tape. I call it Emacs tape all the time. They were one of the first companies I recall them using it on their quads. But uh, So that secures our motor wire up. So we don't have to worry about them getting down on the prop line. You can see, especially over here, how it kind of curves down to get down to the ESC. The pad's right down here. Our ESC is mounted on rubber mounting. Oh, I think I forgot to measure this. I suspect this is, is this 20 by 20? Ah, it's 25. So 25 by 25 mounting for our flight stack there. Although I do see holes. Uh, so if you were to buy the frame and want to build one out, so we've got 30 by 30 and 25 by 25 mounting for your flight stack. Uh, obviously there's room in there for a Vista on the bottom side of things. Uh, let's turn this over. Let's. Oh yeah, we've got several different mounting holes here on the bottom. Uh, like I say, if you buy the Bind and Fly, this can come with what we used to call the Vista when Caddx was selling it. Now we call it Run Cam, Run Cam Link or the Wasp. Um, so you can get those uh, mounts uh, just fine or add your own if that's what you're doing or you just want to build one too. Uh, you would mount that to the bottom. Uh, that would be the place and you have plenty of space. Hopefully you can see down in there, there's plenty of space to add those in with uh, should be plenty of wire clearance as well. Uh, something I forgot to mention in the highlight, we do have that capacitor down there that helps to kind of smooth out any sort of voltage spikes that might be getting into our flight controller. Helps keep the uh, 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 passing of the voltage cleaner. Helps with tune. Uh, helps with probably overall electronic component health as well because you don't have those voltage spikes. So just to kind of sum up what I started the video with, I'm curious about those people that really like this prop protected design. We've seen a lot of iterations. What is it? that draws you to this design do you have traditional quads that don't have prop protection too and what do you see as the advantage one over another i i hope i made it clear on what the drawbacks are to budget friendly builds yeah you save more money there's no two ways about that you could save substantial amount of money depending upon what other uh, product you might be comparing this to but there are some sacrifices that we have to make uh, the two that i want to make sure we're all aware of and if you missed it maybe you're skimming through um, spi express lrs receiver sorry i'm kind of covering my mouth here our receiver is uh, spi so it's tied to the beta flight version as well as uh, the OSD just didn't seem to update as quickly as I'm used to. So I'm wondering if that's a CPU performance issue. I plugged it in. Uh, of course, I wasn't flying it or I'm inside, couldn't get any satellites or anything like that. I didn't see any high CPU usage when I just plugged it in to my computer on Betaflight. Otherwise, I would have shown you that in the video. Uh, I'm looking at a few different versions. The version that I have here with the 4S, uh, it comes in at 259 and change. Uh, if we jump over to uh, the analog version that's 6S, um, oddly enough, it's showing 259 and 78 as well. So the 6S version is the same as the 4S version. Is that common? I don't think it is. Uh, but the Wasp version, so the previous air unit from DJI, uh, 429, 78. And the O3 version, 559. So depending upon what you're planning to spend your money on. Oh, something else I want to know if you're still here. And if you are, thank you very much. Has anyone tried their batteries? The Darwin FPV batteries and your thoughts on those? I haven't. Um, so I can't really report anything about my experience with them, but I would be curious on, on gathering some information. So at that point in time where I try them to see if my opinion on their batteries fits what your opinion on those batteries is. It would be helpful down the line. I would appreciate that. Uh, if you have any other comments, questions, suggestions, or otherwise about the Darwin FPV products or the Synape 3.5, please let me know in the comments section below. I appreciate your time. Thanks for watching.